Part five, Stop Pretending. What happened when my big sister went crazy by Sonia Soames. During history class, I notice Molly scribbling something on a scrap of paper. She passes it to Lindsay when Mrs. Ray isn't looking. Lindsay reads it and giggles, peeking in my direction. She passes it to Jessica, who stifles a laugh and passes it to Rachel, who grins and passes it to Megan. Megan's sitting right next to me. She reads it in Snickers, but doesn't pass it to me. Instead, she crumples it up and stuffs it into her desk. When Megan gets called up to read her report to the class, I sneak my hand into her desk and pull out the note. It says, Cookie Sisters Cuckoo. And underneath the words is a drawing of a girl with her eyes crossed and her hair looking like she just stuck her finger into an electric outlet. I cram the note into my pocket and pray for the bell to ring so I can escape before anyone sees my face. I hate them all. In French class, Madame V begins the lesson by reading aloud the first stanza of a famous French poem. Il pleure dans mon cœur comme il pleut sur la ville. Quelle est cette langueur qui pénètre mon cœur? Then she looks up and without any warning calls on me to translate it. I swallow hard and try. It's raining in my heart like it's raining in the city. What is this sadness that pierces my heart? Saying these words out loud, right in front of the whole class, makes me feel like I'm not wearing any clothes. Boston. At least a few times a year, Father takes the whole family on his annual tour of Boston. He used to be a taxi driver, so it's a pretty good tour. We climb into the station wagon and cruise along the curves of the Charles River to get to the heart of downtown. Father tailgates, mother backseat drives, my sister and I hunt for the letters of the alphabet. Father steers past the old North Church, Bunker Hill Monument, and the pier where the Boston Tea Party happened. My sister and I thumb wrestle in the back seat. He points out an apartment on Bowden Street where John Kennedy used to live. He shows us Longfellow's house and Paul Revere's, but the house my sister and I want to see most is the one father lived in when he was a little boy. An old brick building on Myrtle Street with 28 and a half written in stained glass above the door. We stopped for lunch in Little Italy at the European where father took mother on their first date. If you eat your carrots, he tells us, you'll grow hair on your chest. We've heard him say this hundreds of times, but it still makes my sister and me giggle. We take a ride on the swan boats, then stroll through the public gardens. Father holds mother's hand. My sister and I search for all the spots we've read about so many times and make way for ducklings. We take a ride on the swan boats, then stroll through the public gardens. Father holds mother's hand. My sister and I search for all the spots we've read about so many times and make way for ducklings. At least a few times a year, Father takes the whole family on his annual tour of Boston, but today when he took us and my sister wasn't there, the back seat seemed huge and I spent most of the time just trying not to cry. Like Alice, sister says she feels like Alice trapped in Wonderland, forced to take potions and pills. Drink me makes her head shrink. Eat me makes it grow. She wishes she could get small enough to float right out through the keyhole of that six inch thick iron door on a sea of her own tears. Isn't that what Alice did in that Disney movie? Isn't it, she demands. Alice was the one with the ruby slippers, wasn't she? Sister stomps her foot. Then she clicks her heels together three times and whirls and twirls like she's caught in a cyclone until she collapses onto her bed, curling up into a tight fist. She opens her mouth to scream, but no sound comes out. And when I sit on the edge of her bed and reach out to stroke her hair, she doesn't even notice. One bit of difference. When I used to wake up frightened in the middle of the night, Sister would come and sit on the edge of my bed until I fell back to sleep. Now no one is there in the middle of the night. No one for me and no one for her. There's no one for her day or night, and it doesn't matter how much I want to help, because even when I sit on the edge of her bed, she doesn't know I'm there. Nothing I do or say makes one bit of difference. Tired. I'm tired of having a crazy sister. I'm tired of being the sister of a crazy person. I'm tired of visiting her in the hospital and of all those zombies wandering the quarters mumbling gibberish. I'm tired of this lump in my throat and this ache in my chest and these knots that gnaw at my stomach. I'm tired of having nobody to talk to. I'm tired of walking to school alone and of walking home from school alone and of crying until my eyes look I've walked into a door.
I'm tired of my parents fighting so loud that the whole block trembles and then the awful silence. I'm tired of not knowing when my sister will get well or if she will be well again. I'm tired of not having any fun and of not getting any of the attention and of things not being like they used to be and of things being like they are and of father never hugging me and of mother always wanting me to rub her back and I'm tired of rubbing her back. And I'm tired of listening to her weep through my bedroom wall at night and to father snoring right through it. I'm tired of trying to cheer her up and of trying to convince her that my sister doesn't really mean all those nasty things she says. I'm tired of not believing in God or in miracles or in angels or in fairies or fairy godmothers. I'm tired of being 13 and of not being 12 anymore and of wanting to help my sister and of not being able to help. Last night, they found Audrey Becker's mother. Face down in the pond, she'd been missing a week. People said she'd gone nuts. Now she's dead. There's this thought I can't shake from my head, no matter how hard I try. There's this thought. Bicycle ride. I glide out onto the fresh paved road and pedal hard until the wind lifts my hair off my shoulders and a trap door at the back of my skull swings open, letting the gloom swirl out. My guidance counselor. On Monday, I told Mr. G how depressed and lonely I was. He told me no one wants to make friends with someone who looks miserable. He said I ought to try putting a smile on my face. Even a pretend one would do. I thought this was idiotic, but I was desperate. All week long, I forced a grin onto my lips. It felt painted on, tight, frozen. I was sure everyone knew it was an act. But then someone smiled back. They hadn't noticed my smile was a lie. Somebody else said hello. I couldn't believe how easily I'd fooled them and even fooled myself because I found that the more I smiled, the more I really felt like smiling. On Friday, Sarah invited me to her slumber party, so I guess maybe Mr. G isn't such an idiot after all. Slumber party levitation. When it's my turn, I lie down on the rug and the girls kneel around me in a hushed circle. They slip their forefingers underneath me and then on a whispered count of three, they lift up. For those few seconds I'm floating in the air, I don't think about my sister at all. In gym class, ever since her mother died, no one seems to know what to say to Audrey, so they mostly just act like she isn't there. At least they've stopped calling her Odd Audrey. Today in gym class, I knew no one would choose her to be their partner, so I asked her if she'd be mine. We'll never talk about it, but Audrey and I have a lot in common. Over it. Walking home from school with Sarah to do our homework together, I see Molly and Kate up ahead. And for the first time since they dumped me, I don't feel a thing. I don't even wish they'd get hit by a truck anymore.